Hi, I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Adrienne Schneer, and I am so excited to be here today with Alessia Lapina, HR and Recruitment Specialist. After working for some of the world's top companies, including Tiffany & Co., Acor, and LVMH, Alessia has decided to hang her own shingle by founding her consulting agency, assisting small and medium-sized businesses with their HR and recruitment needs, as well as providing consultation to individuals seeking career growth and employment. Thanks for being here with us on the podcast today. Thank you so much. And thank you for that introduction. Yes, of course. Well, I'm so pleased to have you here. First, I'd love to learn more about you and what brought you to this place. Absolutely. So I actually did not plan on going into HR recruitment at all. I started doing my BA at York University in Law and Society and had my eyesight set on law school. And during university, just found that, you know, that is not my strength and not something that would make me happy. And at the same time, you know, I I loved working with people and really helping them grow, finding them new placements. Like I found a lot of my friends jobs (laughs) and it's something that I kind of naturally gravitated towards. So after graduating in my BA, I stayed for my HR certificate. And very quickly got a placement in a recruitment agency where I focused specifically on legal recruitment. So I did that for my internship. And then that was my first job out of university as well. After that, was very lucky to start as a HR generalist with Pusateri's Fine Foods, which is a local company. And from there, moved on in various HR leadership roles to Tiffany and Company. With a core, I led their talent acquisition strategy and talent acquisition management for North and Central America. So most notably for Fairmont Hotels across the region. And most recently, after going on maternity leave for 18 months and having my baby, I switched roles and went to LVMH, which I absolutely loved. I was the head of HR for Canada for Benefit Cosmetics with them. So also taking care of recruitment there, but really quickly found that, you know, I was ready to do something on my own and really explore my passions with helping businesses and individuals. And I wanted to really marry that. So started consulting on my own recently, about five months ago with Lapina Consulting. And as you mentioned, helping small and medium sized businesses, both with HR and recruitment, as well as individuals. So helping individuals really with, you know, advice around career growth and finding employment, as well as things like offer negotiations and any really assistance that people might need. Yeah, that's great. So your path changed at the very start and you ended up finding something that you love and now you're you're doing it on your own, which is huge. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely scary. I think I said it to somebody a week ago. It's a lot of self-belief and a lot of Googling because even, you know, doing it for over 10 years, there are still things that you question yourself on. So, I mean, I think in today's day and age, questioning yourself, having imposter syndrome, changing careers, all of that is really prevalent, I think, among, among millennials. So I'm excited to be starting this new chapter. For sure, for sure. And so today our conversation is really going to center around the HR aspect of what companies are looking for, what firms are looking for, and we're going to draw parallels between what they're looking for and what schools are looking for as well. Because there are some really interesting parallels, I think, because I've been on both sides. I've been on the HR side at in the private sector, and I've been on the admissions committee side as a member, as an active member of those committees. And so what I found in my experience is that there are some really salient similarities between the two that I think we're really going to be able to pull out today that's going to help people who are going through either process really shine and believe in themselves. So why don't we start sort of at the beginning and we'll work our way through the job application or the admissions application process. 
So you'll speak more about the job application process and I'll speak more about the admissions process. But why don't we start at the beginning of, of those, which is writing your materials and, and picking your referees or, or who's going to write your letters of recommendation for you. What advice would you give to someone who's just starting that process? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing that you mentioned, you know, for letters of recommendation or references that you will need, I found that many people, especially new to, you know, looking for employment and just starting out in their career, don't really have anybody lined up. And I found when I was asking for that information, they scrambled a little bit. So I think it's really important to understand who those individuals may be. Of course, it's important that those are not exactly personal contacts. So for somebody starting out in their career, I would want to see, you know, people that you worked with in any capacity. It could be educational. So for example, if you wrote for your school newspaper, you know, and and there's an editor, that would be a great individual. If there's a professor that you worked with closely on projects, you know, that's another another person. Even any part-time job that you had, you know, I think that is also a great resource. But I think definitely gearing towards people that can speak to your your capacity as a potential employee and how you work overall. Mm-hmm. And I think something that you said is so important, which it, it which is that it has to be someone who can actually speak to your skills, to what you brought to the yes. table. And so a question that I get all the time is, well, but, you know, I work in this lab or I work for this politician and I want the politician or the lab manager, whoever they are, or the the owner of the the rather the PI of the lab to be the person who is signing the letter. But so mm-hmm. many times applicants don't work directly with the person who's running the whatever it is. So the advice that I often give is you've got to be able to ask somebody, you've got to ask somebody who can actually speak to what you did. It's not going to be a generic letter. Yes, they worked here. They did a great job. They actually have to speak to what it is that you did on the ground. So what do you have to say to that? Absolutely. 100% agree with you. So the same thing for references, as well as reference letters that we've asked for in the past. And Oftentimes, companies will follow up with that individual as well. So it's very important that you're choosing a person who is an advocate, who is going to be able to promote your skills, sell you, who's going to be passionate about your success, and who's going to be able to answer basic questions about how you performed in that capacity. So absolutely, I think it's very important to choose a person who is actually closely working with you and involved and is able to speak to those points. Because if you're picking a generic person, you're not you're not going to impress the person on the other end of reading that letter or speaking with that individual on the phone. So I think it is important to choose a true advocate for yourself. Mm-hmm. So To be clear, it doesn't have to be the big name, right? No, absolutely not. And and I mean, I understand where people are coming from. I think they think, you know, it it may be impressive if that politician signs the letter or if it's the lab manager. But at the end of the day, that is not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise is speaking to an individual, as you said, who can speak to your experience. And that's all I would want to see as a recruiter going through that exercise. So you know, to me, it didn't matter who signed it. I want to see substance over an impressive name or an impressive title. Yes, I completely agree with you. When I was on admissions committees, and so I'll speak about that experience, even though I I was over in the private sector as well. But when I was on admissions committees for graduate professional schools, there was a huge difference, huge difference between letters that really, really spoke to the qualities of the individual, the skills with examples of what they did and what they brought to the table, what they contributed to the team versus the more like generic letters that you could tell were a copy paste job. You could, you, yeah, I'm sure have templates. seen that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Sign templates. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, again, from an individual like yourself in that, in that role and myself, when you're reviewing literally hundreds of these, you want to be the one that stands out. So you definitely want an advocate writing that letter for you. So that's a great point. So from your perspective and from your experience in a reference letter or in a letter of recommendation or something that you're reading from another person who's vouching essentially for the skills of the applicant, 
What makes someone stand out for for you? I think generally, again, staying away from a template, really being honest and authentic and not just telling me that you dreamed about working for the company since you were five years old. And again, you know, it's very easy to see once you read a handful, what is a template with the name of the company being changed and what is an actual gender, you know, an authentic letter. And I think in today's day and age, when you're applying for work specifically, not everybody requires a cover letter or a reference letter. So if you're going that route, make sure it's very authentic and that you're actually using it to say something, to differentiate yourself, whatever that may be, and not just copying and pasting and using it as a template just to have it and just to apply. I think at that point, it's better not to have it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so for me, what that's meant for my clients and as a member of admissions committees, what that's meant is that there's actually like a cohesive narrative that I'm able to read and understand really where this person is coming from, what has caused them to want what they want. And it doesn't mean that there needs to be an entire chronology of their entire life, but there needs to be a thread that draws me in and keeps me there, right? A personal connection, I would say, right? A story. Exactly. A lot of the times when I'm I'm reviewing resumes or cover letters, I don't have a picture of the person. So Mm -hmm. I think it's really important when something jumps out that connects with me as a human being and as an individual that wants to learn more, that wants to pursue this person, that wants to reach out. So I think that's that's the goal, essentially, if you're going to, you know, submit a cover letter for a position. Yes. And I think and it's the same for for admissions committees. They're also looking for that connection. They don't want the like robotic template. Right. They don't want that cookie cutter template that like you can get on Google, probably. But they're not. They don't work. <laughs> they don't work. And so it's the same for for applying for jobs. They People want to connect. People want to know that you're a human being. You have this amazing experience. And quite frankly, people worry, well, I don't have enough experience. There's other, pre- you know, other people have more experience than I do. None of that matters. None of that matters no. because it's about what your experience means to you. I agree. I think a lot of what differentiates candidates is soft skills. Yes. And I think it's that communication piece. It's the ability to connect. It's passion and drive that you sense throughout the process. Everything from, you know, again, that cover letter, having a personal touch to the way you communicate over the initial email contact to your interview style to follow ups. I think that is what differentiates a person. And I've seen time and time again, people being hired with less experience, maybe companies that are not that impressive, maybe people that have a lot to learn because At the end of the day, the people that are hiring you, the hiring managers, the recruiters, you know, we are all human beings that spend a minimum of eight to nine hours a day at work. And I think we're all looking to work with people that we actually want to connect with. We want to spend time with. We're looking for people that are going to bring a positive cultural aspect to the organization and cultural quote unquote, because I, you know, We hear a lot that we need to be as objective as possible and put our biases aside. At the end of the day, yes, and we all go through training for that, but people still want to connect with somebody that they want to spend time with. So I think the personal connection and the soft skills are number one in the process. Yes, yes. And and you said earlier being genuine, and I totally agree with that. Being genuine in your letter, meaning that you can relate to anyone on the other side by telling your story, yeah. by explaining what you can bring, how you bring it. And and like you said, you don't need to have all the experience in the world. You You need to have a connection. And I think that that's so important. I think also on the candidate side, and that's the side that I've been on a lot as well and changed a lot of jobs and, and careers and everything. And I think it's important for yourself as well to know that If you don't get the job, at least you put yourself out there. At least you were authentic. At least you were yourself. And I think staying yourself throughout the process, and we'll talk about that later, is difficult. But when you're staying true to that part of you and you're going through the process in this way, I think it also allows you to grow and and really strengthen those skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why don't we talk about that now, actually, staying yourself through the process. So what would be some of your advice for how to stay yourself and not try to fit into this mold that you perceive you need to fit into? 
So I can give you a great example of how people fit into a mold. So I would say, you know, one of the most important questions and one question that you're going to get asked in the interview process, no matter where you're applying is, what is an area of opportunity for you? So what are you, what should you improve on? What is a weakness? In other words, the number one, nine out of 10 people that will tell me is they're too detail oriented or they take on too much work. So this is definitely an answer that they've heard before and is Googled. It is not authentic. It is not genuine. And it doesn't leave a lasting or good impression, right? Right away, it tells me that you are not committed to the process. And the person that came to the interview today, it was a show. Once you hear that question from every single candidate in a day of 20 interviews. And believe you me, this has happened every single time I've tried to recruit for any job. It becomes very, very evident when somebody is being themselves and is being authentic. So I would say, you know, stay away from what you think the employer may want to hear within reason. There's definitely another spectrum of sharing too much information or being too open and you always want to stay professional. But I think definitely, you know, if somebody's asking you for your strengths or your weaknesses, be honest, because that is something that is going to come out once you get the job. So you want to be upfront and honest as well, not to surprise anybody in a negative way and to really be open about the resources that the company and the leader is going to need to make sure that you're set up for success. So for me, you know, being detail oriented is a weakness of mine. I am not detail oriented and I'm very upfront and honest about that. And, you know, what resources I might need to make sure that that doesn't prevent me from being successful in this role. I also always provide an example of how I've dealt with it and how I've been aware of of the fact that that is a weakness of mine. So when people are being honest about what is a weakness or what is a strength and becoming as themselves to the interview process, it tells me a lot more than just what their weakness is. It tells me that they're self-aware. It tells me that, you know, they're a team player, that they're honest, they have integrity. So I think it's always just important to stay away, as you said, from Google when it comes to how they answer interview questions and really, you know, not be afraid to share that piece of yourself because at the end of the day, you are the one that's going to be coming to work afterwards for, you know, every day for years. And, and that person's going to come out anyways. So I think it's just really important to be upfront, be yourself and, and present that in the best possible way. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I think something that you said is so on point, which is that if you're genuine, you will stand out because so many people put on that show. Right. And so, and that's true in every single admissions cycle that I've been a part of in every single job search that I've been a part of on the recruitment side that it's so obvious who's being genuine and who's not. It's Very. so obvious. It's And and the thing is, is if you're genuine, you don't have to try to be genuine, right? It, it comes naturally once you're comfortable with yourself and your story. Absolutely. And I think it's very hard to get there. You know, obviously, you know, imposter syndrome and and shyness and anxiety, these are all things that come to play. But I think it's really important to remember that, again, at the end of the day, you are you and you are going to be showing up afterwards. So essentially that interview process, you know, you are not serving yourself if you are pretending to be somebody else. Yeah. And the thing is something that, that I often talk with my clients about and, and a question that I often get is, but what happens if, but you know, if they don't like something about me, what happens if they don't like my story, if they don't like my experience? And I have an answer that, that I give to this, which I'll share after, but what would you say? I would say then it's probably not the place for you. Yeah. I would say the same thing. So. One thing that I always told people in an interview with me is don't be nervous because you are interviewing me as much as I am interviewing you. And I think candidates need to remember that, you know, whether it's applying to a school or applying to to work, we are so set up to be in a mindset of this rat race of must get a job, must get a placement that we really forget about the piece of will I be happy here? Will this place serve me? Is this what's going to set me up for success? 
is this where I'm going to grow? And I think it's really important to focus on those things as well. And if somebody doesn't like what you're saying, I mean, there is an element of being, again, self-aware and assessing the situation and understanding if it's really you, did you mess up in a way? Did you say something inappropriate? I mean, there, there are there are situations that, you know, call for that. But at the end of the day, if they don't like you, is that a place where you want to spend the next two, three, five years coming in every day and not not feeling like you can be yourself? Personally, that's not something I would be able to do and be happy. And I think, you know, we don't talk enough in this process about being happy. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. So I think it's it's really important to to remember that. I think you're absolutely right. And I just remember this ex- one of the many experiences that I had applying to firms was that I was very much in my mind interviewing them as much as they were interviewing me. And I remember thinking like, how do, like, do they think they're representing themselves well here? <laughs> you know? Like it was shocking to me that in these processes that, you know, they're bringing me in for an interview, they're trying to sell the firm to me. They're not doing that great a job. You know, I, I'm going to do another podcast episode on, you know, bad interviews and, and bad interviewers. I think it should be a really, <laughs> really fun episode to do. But I remember going home afterwards thinking to myself, I never, I never will work here. I will not. And I got offered yep. all these jobs at all these firms and I turned them all down because I thought to myself, this is not a place for me. This is not a place for me. So I think you're absolutely right that we have to be able to talk about our growth where where we'll be able to thrive. Because at the end of the day, you're spending your time, your really precious time working with and for these other people at these companies. And you want to make sure that you're in a position to thrive. Absolutely. And I think if you're not happy coming to work, you will not be successful. You will not have drive. You will not have motivation. So at the end of the day, it makes zero sense to just get a job to get a job. And this is coming from a person who has cried every day of a certain position that I have been in because I was miserable and I was not successful. I wasn't good at my job. And I really thought, you know, maybe this isn't for me until I found a new role. And I thought, wow, I can really make an impact and I'm really good at this. And it was a completely different experience. So absolutely, like you said, it's better to say no to the money or or to the role or to the offer and keep looking and struggle for a little bit and then be happy and successful in the end. Right. Then choose something where you will feel stuck, unhappy and go on a potentially a downward spiral. So I do think it's really important to really stay true to the environment that you want to be a part of as well. Yeah, I completely agree with you. So in the process of applying with your resume, your cover letter, let's talk actually for a second about the resumes because the resumes are... I have so much to say. (laughs) Okay, I I can't wait to hear because this is one of the things that I work with with my clients on so, so deeply because the resume and the CV are really important documents. And let's just cut to the chase. The word templates and the Googleable templates, they're not, they don't cut it. No. So I have just a few rules about resumes. And number one is don't overcomplicate it. There is a lot of people that send me resumes that are over formatted with photos, with graphics. Even if you're a graphic designer and you're sending me a resume like that, Do not. That's what a portfolio is for. Exactly. A resume should be very easy to read, have a very easy flow, you know, and not be over formatted. It should always be submitted in PDF and not Word. I cannot tell you how many candidates have lost out on a position because my system couldn't open their resume properly because it wasn't in PDF. If you're submitting it in Word or something else, There's different formats as well that just look like a virus. And I am not going to risk a virus to open your resume. So PDF, make it very easy to read, easy flow. I want to see numbers. So if you have made an impact, there should be an achievement section of your resume. Even if it's school, there should be numbers attached to that. So if there's a possibility of having any percentages or any actually, you know, objective way to evaluate your achievements or success, those should be on your resume. So let me just give an example of that for anyone who's listening. So an example of that might be, you know, distinction or, or award awarded to top 1% of students. 
something like that. Or if you received a scholarship, assigning a number to that. So $2,000 a year, $5,000 per semester or 500, whatever the case may be. You want to assign some sort of quantifiable figure to the experience in order to be able to just help the the reader just get an, a sense of of what it is that you did. Another example might be if you were working in a research lab or if you were interviewing participants on a research project or something, you know, interviewed or conducted interviews or recruited, you know, 1,000 participants or 500 participants, something that really grounds your experience so that it's an objective number. And then from there, we can ask questions. Something that I always say about a resume is that every single thing that you write, every single point, and I have a very specific way that I do this with my clients, is a speaking point. Absolutely. And I see a lot of very generic resumes of people copying and pasting from job descriptions. And again, it's very evident and it doesn't serve you. One thing that I do think is useful is to go through job descriptions to understand the language that is used to describe experience and using very similar language. But I think, again, being detailed about your experience and really thinking outside the box. I know a lot of people just starting out think, you know, I worked at a book square. I didn't really do anything. All I did is put books away. There are, I'm sure, a lot more things that you could speak to. And I think it's really important to really consider every aspect of your position or your school experience and make sure that that's on your resume as well. Volunteer experience. You know, if there's no work experience, especially, you really want to fill up that page with everything and anything that, again, could make you stand out, could make you shine. Yeah. And so I think you you raise a really good point that if you're working somewhere or doing something, you have some experience and you're not sure what to pull out of it, think about what your job required of you to be successful. So if you are working at that bookstore, let's say, then you worked as part of a team. It wasn't just shelving books, it was inventory. You're working with actual product. You're working as, like I said, as part of a team with quite likely a hierarchy where you're answering to somebody else and perhaps others are answering to you. This is a huge element of teamwork. Maybe you led a team. Maybe you led one meeting per month, you know, and, and or maybe you started a book club for the other people who you were working with. Maybe you met your sales goals. Maybe, you know, there's so many things that we can really delve into in order to pull out what those really important characteristics of your day-to-day were. Yeah, absolutely. And all of those should be on there. One thing, again, you know, just about the formatting and and resumes overall, I, I've seen a bigger trend of people adding their photos. So that's definitely something I would stay away from. I've seen it, especially in the younger generations. I think, again, overall, just... Keeping your resume, you know, easy to read. If you have work experience, that should be really at the top of your resume with education, probably somewhere towards the bottom. If you're just out of school, you probably want to highlight your education experience. So that would probably be more towards the top. So depending on where you are. And again, you know, all experience matters and you really don't know what the individual on the other end is looking for. So, you know, I'll give you an example. I was hiring for an e-commerce manager for LVMH and we did not have anybody with cosmetics experience, which is what we were looking for. And then had a candidate who like seven years or eight years ago was a part-time makeup artist at Shoppers Drug Mart. This is what made her stand apart from everybody else that applied. So I think, you know, like you said, really think about all the elements that made you successful in your role. Make sure that that's included. And especially when you're starting out, I would personally include all your experience. For sure. And and this is something that I talk about with my clients all the time. You know, they'll say, oh, but I, you know, I just worked at, you know, this office or in this as a waitress or as a waiter or, or as an airline attendant. And they say, you know, but that's not relevant to medical school or to law school. And I say, no, but it is. It's customer service. It is. It's yes. customer service. You're <laughs> it's serving people. That's all that you're doing. You're serving people. It also tells me you can probably come up with an answer very quickly. You probably know how to multitask. You know how to deal with difficult people in difficult situations. So that experience would tell me a lot about what you've probably done that again would make you stand apart from all the others. Yes. And I just, I want to go back to one thing that you said, which is where to place education versus work experience on the resume. Because this actually comes up all the time too. I totally agree with you that right out of school, you want your education right up top. But where that ends up 
depends on your experience over time. And so there are really no hard and fast rules for a resume. And, and so they, you can really personalize it within these sort of formatting limits that, that we're talking about. You can really personalize your resume. There's, like I said, there's no hard and fast rules. So if you're, you know, five, six years out of school and you've had some great positions since then, your work experience might be right up top along with maybe some, oh, you know, distinctions that you've got and then followed by your education. So it's really a strategic choice that you're making. Yeah, absolutely. It's about what's going to make you stand out right now, right? Like if you are a Harvard graduate with zero work experience, you probably want me to see that you're a Harvard graduate as soon as I look at your at your resume. If you've had experience at an amazing company or if you've had any relevant work experience, that is most likely what I want to see first before I start caring what school you went to. Because at the end of the day, no matter your education, it's the work experience that does set you apart as well, I would say. At a Again, certain no point, matter sure, what yes. that, yeah, at a certain point. So, you know, I think it's, it, it really depends on what do you want to see? And I think really put yourself in the shoes of the person who's reading this resume. What are they going to see? What stands out? What language are you using? How are you formatting it? What is being, you know, bolded? What is being italicized? I think all of these things are really going to help. It's not just to make your resume look pretty. It's really to subliminally influence the person that is reading your resume to see the things that you really need them to see. Absolutely. And so when let's let's talk also about networking. Let's talk about the importance of networking and how that can lead to your advancement. Networking is the number one tool for advancement and getting jobs for me. So I think, you know, it's very important to understand where you may potentially want to work and start connecting with people there ASAP. Do not wait for time of applications to go in. You want to do that as soon as possible. My advice would be do not focus on the HR or recruiter people at that company. Focus on who may be the potential hiring manager or person that you work with. Reach out to them and tell them about yourself. Most likely, if you ask them for a coffee, they will not go have a coffee with you because people are busy and they will not invest that time. So A, don't take it personally. And B, I think don't ask in the beginning because they don't know you. So I think it's really important to reach out, tell them about yourself, tell them why you're reaching out, and then probably put in your calendar, you know, every couple of months to reach out to them with an update about how you're doing and and what you're doing. You know, if Christmas is around the corner, wish them a Merry Christmas. And I think as you continue to do that, that person will get to know you. And then when that position pops up in that company and you tell them, Hi, as you've known, I've been updating you about, you know, my journey over the last year or over the last six months. I hope you're doing well. I saw that there's a position. Would you, you know, be interested in connecting with me about it? That hiring manager will then say, Hey, been in touch with this person for six months to the recruiter. Mind reaching out? Great candidate. The recruiter is right away influenced to contact that person because that is now a hiring manager referral. So it's looked at completely differently than if you were to reach out to the recruiter themselves or reach out out of the blue. It's also around times of when the job becomes available, you know, that is when the influx of candidates and, you know, people reaching out, that's when that's going to happen. So I really think, again, to stand out, you got to start that process right away. And I think it's incredibly important to utilize LinkedIn to do that. But you can also research people in the company and email them. I don't think that that's, you know, a crazy thing to do, but it's absolutely the number one thing that will set you apart. Great. I, I, I think that that's great advice, especially in this sort of transitionary period where we're still online. Some things are, are, you know, back live in person, but I think that that's great advice either way, regardless of if you're virtual or in person, because you can reach out by email or LinkedIn, or you can attend, perhaps there may be there's some public event that you can attend and reach out and say, Hey, I was at this event. You know, it was great. It was nice to see you. Or, or something like that. So I think that your this strategy can work regardless of the the medium. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's just really important to 
to do to build your network even for the future. Mm -hmm. I can give you an example of a student in hospitality who I met when he was first year at George Brown Hospitality. He had reached out to me to thank me for speaking at their college, followed up with telling me that, you know, he met an achievement, he graduated, blah, blah, blah. He got his first job, he got a second job. I've been in touch with him now for four years. I am his advocate. If he asks me to refer or introduce him to anybody in my network, I will absolutely go out of my way Because at this point, I know everything he's been up to. I am, you know, aware of his success. I know that he's committed. And I know he doesn't just reach out to me for something. When he needs something. Exactly. Yeah. So he reaches out because he's generally, he's genuinely invested in building his network. So again, being genuine, being authentic, you know, and actually putting the time in is what's going to set you apart. Yeah. So it, it does make a very, very big difference. And it's all about relationships. It's all, we call it now. hundred percent. But it's relationships. Yep. It, it also, what makes, I think, working enjoyable yes. is <laughs> building relationships yeah. and having personal relationships with people. And a lot of people that, you know, I've networked with, for lack of a better word, I've become friends with. Yes. And so I think it's, it's, it's something that you should learn to enjoy and participate in. And it's going to make a very big difference, both in your personal life and your professional life. Yes, I totally agree with you. So I think that we should close out this amazing conversation by talking about understanding what to do if opportunities don't work out and how to deal with rejection. Because rejection for me is just another open door. I have a very close relationship with rejection. You know, I, I've applied for so many jobs in my life and been rejected so many times. And again, when I think about when I just started, there was an NGO that I applied to. It it paid, I think, $25,000 a year. And I didn't get the job and I really wanted it. And I cried so hard. <laughs> and eight or nine years later, you know, there is no way that I would ever consider that job now. So A, everything that happens, happens for a reason, as cheesy as that sounds. But B, Rejection is part of the journey. Rejection is necessary. It is impossible statistically to get every single job. It is not possible. It doesn't teach you anything. I think rejection keeps you humble, really allows you the opportunity to reassess how you're approaching the process. It also teaches you what you want and what you don't want. So I think it's always important to take a moment and reflect every, after every rejection, but don't take it personally. Once you've assessed what could have gone better or differently, I think it's, you know, important to move on and understand that every other person who's currently going through this process, the person that interviewed you, the person that owns the company, every single human being on earth has been through the same and probably worse. And I think rejection is just, you know, it is part of the journey. It is part of the success. And I don't think success is possible without it. I completely agree with you. And on that note, I do have one more question. And this is how I want to round out the conversation, which is what do you think about the importance of mindset through this process? I mean, I think it's an incredibly difficult process, to be honest. I think it's very personal. I think it's frustrating. I think it's difficult. So if you surround yourself with people that support you, if you believe in yourself, if your mindset starts off with expecting that this is going to be the journey, you will not be hired as a director, you know, your first day out of university, you will not become partner within a year. If you come out of the gate prepared and understand that this is going to be the journey and rejection is going to be part of it and understand that you are committed and understand your values then I think you'll be fine. But I think it's, again, it's it's a learning journey. And I think mindset is incredibly important for anything you do in life, but especially this, because it, it is a difficult part of somebody's beginnings when they're just starting out, especially. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate your insights and you're welcome back here anytime. So I think <laughs> that we, we have so much more to talk about. I never feel like one, like one episode is enough, <laughs> but I really appreciate you being here today. Do you have any final thoughts you would, you wanted to share? It's that mindset piece and just not letting yourself get down if you are being rejected and just 
keep going and be yourself. And at the end of the day, no matter what happens, if you do that, at least you're walking away knowing that you did your best. And I think that's the best feeling is knowing that you stay true to yourself and, and you stay true to your integrity. And so when you're young and you worry so much, it's it's very difficult. So I would say, don't worry too much. It's all going to work out. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you for being here with us on the podcast today. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want, and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at Apply Yourself Global and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode, leave this episode a review, and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.